Thank you so much for uh, so many of you uh, joining this uh, seminar and uh, that you want to listen to, to this presentation. Uh, I've got two of my colleagues from the Oxford Internet Institute with me, uh, Ole here in the middle and next to uh, Fabian, he's also departmental research lecturer, and they have worked with me on this very paper, which was a long project. And I try to give you an overview today, not only about this one paper, which is the main work, the main result of my postdoctoral um, time at the OAI. Now, again, as Tim already said, I've got this new position as a departmental research lecturer and nicely fitting to this um, just before I got this new job, uh, this paper um, was accepted for publication and has now been uh, accepted. And uh, I want to give you a larger overview of what this whole research is about, where it fits in, hopefully. I mean, there's always, as you know, many different narratives and many different perspectives that you can take on any individual piece of research. Um, and this one here is on remote work, so a topic that um, I think has become very important for many of us and still is in the years to come, as we can see by this event being a hybrid one with many people joining via Zoom. And what I want to show to you here, or maybe convince you of, maybe not, maybe a bit of provocative title is why the future of work is not remote. And I want to um, start with this um, visualization that you see here, right on the, on the title slide. Um, with remote work or why the future of work is not remote, we are not referring to any technical capability or feasibility. Of course, it is possible from a technical perspective to work remote. We see this from all the participants being, um, sorry, joining us online. Oh, is this is a touch screen. I didn't know. Sorry. <laughs> it's a surprise. You're not the first yeah. one. <laughs> um, but uh, what this talk is about is the socioeconomic, the economic institutional barriers towards remote work, namely to shaping the labor market of the future in a way that the um, geography, that the um, divide between urban and rural areas doesn't play a role anymore. And this is what I want to outline to you. But before I come to our actual research, I want to showcase you how um, the let's say, general opinion has developed toward the topic of remote work, which has in some communities been of importance, but probably was more of a niche topic before the pandemic. So. Let us see how the overall opinion has developed by uh, taking a look at um, articles in the Harvard Business Review. The Harvard Business Review, obviously a very important outlet for many people in the business world. And what you see here on the first slide is a headline from uh, early 2020, that's February 2020, when, the, when it was clear that the pandemic would hit and would affect the labor market in some way. And the title says, what's your company emergency remote work plan? And what we see most interesting here for our case is where the desk is. So, the, sorry. <laughs> so I will not touch that. Oh, how can I go back now? Okay, that worked. How can I go full screen in Outlook? Sorry. Oops. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. And I will not touch the screen. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> I can say you, you, could, you could see it even without me zooming in. So what is most important for us here for our purpose of this talk, maybe talking about the socioeconomic institutional perspective on remote work, is where the desk is. It's not in the office anymore, as we can all see. Instead, it is in the middle of a seat. Of course, in this particular instance, it's suggesting kind of a drowning scenario so that everyone has to think about, okay, what do we do when the pandemic moves on and will will uh, affect more and more parts of the labor market. But I think it already indicates a shift in mindset, a shift in paradigm that people are thinking of not working from the office anymore, but in some other in some other places. And luckily for many, um, the um, the overall pandemic situation has developed more positive throughout the year, and we all got used to it in the year 2020, as is indicated here by the second um, second picture on the slide which is from September 2020. So after the first wave passed through the world, more or less, during summertime, many people got used to some forms of old, new, or hybrid forms of normal. And the overall discussion on remote work has changed as well. Instead of just talking about emergency plans and, and other um, more negative portrayals, remote work got a, got a, got a novel perspective, namely talking about um, the idea that you don't have to do all day video calls from home, but instead that you could work from somewhere else. And this is visualized here on this headline by the workplace indicated by the laptop here, being in the middle of a desert, in the middle of nowhere. So people could actually take a tent, just sit wherever they want and work from there. 
of course, this is disregarding the um, distribution and availability of uh, broadband or internet, but let's go with it. So the overall discussion has changed and it has even developed further as time went on. This year, um, the last um, headline from Harvard Business Review that I'm showing to you here is from March 2022, so a bit less than a year old. And again, the discussion has changed now. The question is on whether remote work is actually better for the environment. So a bit of contrast here, um, or another form of discussion on the horizon. But clearly, the question already implies that some people have thought it is good for the environment because of fewer commutes, because of people being in their local environments, and maybe helping the local communities, all kinds of positive things related to remote work. This, I think, is a general tendency. Of course, I'm simplifying a lot, and I'm disregarding all the medical uh, and uh, public health problems, just focusing on the effects that the pandemic had on our perspective towards remote work. So it looks like the future of work is remote. Everyone can work from wherever they want, as it is um, um, displayed here with this uh, guy sitting again um, somewhere mid in the middle of, of nowhere, having his laptop next to him and enjoying the tranquility of the countryside. However, we argue in our paper that even though it might technically be feasible to work remote, it will continue to pull jobs to large cities. And how do we come to this conclusion, which I'm already uh, showing to you here right now and pinpointing to the most um, relevant figure of our paper, um, how, how did we arrive at this conclusion? We looked at data from a so-called um, online labor market. Online labor markets, for those of you who have not heard of them, are platforms very similar to Amazon or eBay. On Amazon and eBay, you trade commodities, you buy stuff, and you don't really care where the person that sells this particular type of good or product to you, where this person actually sits, where the product comes from. In a similar way, these online labor markets allow people to hire others online. So for example, you are you have a, a young company, a startup, and you want to find web developers that could um, program the website for you that you need for your online shop, or you need an accountant that could do um, everything related to accounting in your company, management consulting, anything you could think of that doesn't need any face-to-face -face interaction could be done via these platforms. The largest, um, the largest examples of these websites uh, globally are Upwork, the freelancer, Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, people per hour, guru.com. You might have heard of some of these. And um, they all are in some kind of global competition with, with, with each other. And it's not 100% sure how many people work on these online platforms in total. There's estimate that we talk about roughly a bit more than 100 million people registered on these platforms and a um, small number, um, um, is, um, around 3 million people, a smaller number, around 3 million people working regularly on these platforms. The investigation of online labor markets is itself a main subject or has been a main subject at the Oxford Internet Institute. Tim, you referred to the different research things that are being done at our department. And there's a particular two um, ERC funded projects on this on this um, respect, um, led by Mark Graham, who looked into the geography of the platform economy, particularly with regards to um, the digital economy in Africa, and Willy de Donwerther and his um, iLabor group, which has developed the so-called online labor index. You might have heard of this index. It's um, kind of big success, I'd like to say, um, from the Oxford Internet Institute, mainly developed by Otto Kessy, who did his postdoc on this project and further maintained and developed, um, among others, also by myself. I took a very little role, and also Fabian, who's sitting over there, mm -hmm. who developed the so-called Online Labor Observatory, or Online Labor Index 2022, which overall has the idea of bringing one kind of um, traditional economic indicator equivalent of the gig economy, which again, due to the global competition between these platforms and all of this happening online, is in many aspects, unfortunately, not available in terms of data and information as we are used to this from, from standard labor market statistics. Okay, so this is the data. We analyzed one of these large online labor platforms. We um, developed uh, together, thanks um, to Ole, who's sitting here in the room as well, we developed um, a data collection infrastructure, I spare you the details of it, that goes onto this online labor index and gathers additional data about these um, individual projects that have happened on one of these platforms and the worker locations so that we could map actually all these transactions with each other, which was important because before that we knew uh, which are the top employer countries and the top employee countries, but we could not really connect. We could not really know where all of this is happening. And particularly, we could not um, 
that we could not go beyond the national level, which we perceive to be an important dimension to also look into urban rural dimensions. As obviously we all know, the overall economy is, is structured hierarchically among um, urban and rural areas. And here's the main result, as I already spoiled it a little bit, namely the global distribution blue dots are those um, represent cities um, with more employers than employees, so essentially buyer locations, and red dots represent those where we have more workers, more employees than employers, that is essentially sellers. And what we see is um, the overall geography is far from um, a level playing field, far from random. We see a um, lot of structure in this, in this map, and most of the demand, as we can see, comes from urban um, areas in the United States, like the coastal regions, and North America in general, as well as West Europe. So, um, of course, here these parts as well. Western Europe, London is a big hub itself, probably also Oxford. And most of the supply comes from, again, urban regions in middle income countries. So, we have a lot here in um, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, South Asia, and the Philippines. And to some surprise, I think we don't see much happening in kind of explainable in Central Asia, which is not that populated, but also many parts of um, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is many of them English-speaking countries and those places of the world that have, in general, low price levels and low wage levels. So it is those places where you would actually expect a lot of this outsourcing happening because it is the cheapest place of the world where you could see cheapest kind of price levels for these types of um, services that people are after, but you um, discover that not much is happening. And similarly, also Latin America is largely absent from the platform, which could partly be explained by um, the fact that these countries are not um, English-speaking um, countries to, um, to a big extent. Um, but as we show in the paper, we have developed a statistical model that tries to explain the overall geography in terms of where uh, most projects are and where um, the higher wage levels are with um, a limited number of economic and infrastructure variables. And what we can show is that a very low number of macroeconomic variables, if you want to say it like this, explain the geography, both on the national level as well as in the sub, on the subnational level, both in OECD countries and global South countries. And the factors that are most important are the following. Of course, the distribution of broadband infrastructure. The better the internet infrastructure, the more people are online and the higher the wages. That's, I think, kind of expected, but it is still an important phenomenon if you think about it that only roughly half of the world population have internet access. So still one kind of clear takeaway is for policymakers, if you want people to participate in the digital economy, get this leapfrogging that people are after, get this digital development, you need to bring internet, good quality internet to them. But this is not the only thing, and it is, um, it is, um, um, closely correlated with other factors, namely, and this was to our surprise, um, general the uh, lack of um, the strength of the local economy that is more or less GDP per capita, so kind of the richer the region up to a certain level, like a middle income level, is where we see more work happening. Um, the um, level of local human capital or education in general, like up to um, high levels of secondary education the secondary uh, level education, um, you will see more projects and also uh, what we call the um, um, the IT specialization of the economy. So we have come up with a number of proxies. That is the share of ICT related service exports of all exports and um, the share of local GDP happening in the ICT sector as proxies for this kind of um, comparative advantage that certain regions might have in in the IT sector. And this seems to play a huge role too. And overall, we conclude that it really is those regions that already had a comparative advantage in the in other parts of the economy are the ones that are most active in online labor markets. So instead of really seeing a liberation of distance, of the curse of distance, or instead of seeing any kind of um, level playing field emerging in this online world, we see that the old patterns are kind of transcending here and that they are perpetuated one more time. And this seems another um, 
another um, analysis that we have in the paper and the appendix seems to be relatively constant over time. So the geography has not changed that much from the first year of our analysis, 2013, to the last one, 2020, that we have in the analysis. And the question that relates from all of this is then, okay, why is it? Why do we see such an unequal geography appearing and not a more equal one as one would have maybe thought in the beginning? And one explanation that we talk about is um, the network nature of jobs. Increasingly, jobs are considered as networks of skills. This here is a visualization from another paper um, that is also using online labor market data by Anderson 2017, published in PNAS. And she investigated um, online, sorry, supply and demand for online labor. And what I'm showing you here is just um, a dense network, a just cloud of, of different skills. Every dot here represents a skill from this online platform. And they are colored into by a different cluster that they belong to. So depending on um, those skills that are um, that are more densely connected to each other, so that appear more often together in job adverts, they form different clusters and they have been named. So we have, for example, here in blue, things related to programming, in green, we have um, things related to design types of jobs, writing. Um, then things around um, around administrative assistance and so on. And the perspective, which has already been uh, applied back in to other data sets um, with other researchers, um, one big data set that has been investigated is by a company called Burning Glass Technology. Some of you might have heard of it. It's like a big data provider of job adverts. Here, the online labor data, the big plus that it has is it does not allow only to look at demand for jobs, so kind of job adverts, but also for the skills that people have and really the matching of the two, as we can observe the full um, the full labor market online. Still, what the main takeaway is, is that if you are the person that has particular types of skills that are on the central nodes in the network, so that are there with the bigger nodes right in the center, you will be more likely to find a good job because there's a lot of demand for your job and you will also have higher chances of seeing a good wage level. If you are a person that has these skills that are there on the periphery, it is less likely for you to get a job and also to get a high wage level. And of course, if you are a person that lacks any of these skills, then you will be very unlikely to be competitive in the online labor market and you will rather not find a job. And this is the link that connects our descriptive investigation about the geography um, with the overall remote work st story. As we conclude, skills needed to participate in the online labor market, they are just not coming out of thin air. They are just not distributed evenly across the globe, but they are again connected to the geography as they thrive in cities, which are increasingly seen as networks of networks. What we see here on the left-hand side is a visualization um, that you might have seen on whatever, online networks or on TV, like the city being looked at from a network perspective, so that there's things happening in the city connecting different dots. And this is adopted more and more by the um, field of complexity economics, which is not a huge field within the Oxford Internet Institute, I have to say, but there's the Institute for New Economic Thinking, for example, Doyen Farmer, who has done work on this. And... Um, what they all have in common is that they often look at economic, socioeconomic phenomena um, from, a, from a network perspective. We just look at this one network, the skill demand in the online labor market, but you could also think about the skill supply as a network of different skills, the skills that people have, so maybe here, this layer. And you could be, maybe think of cities as the enabling institutions, another network that connects supply and demand. And how does it do so? It does so via enabling institutions such as universities, uh, vocational training, business opportunities, innovation, everything happening in cities that connects between the demand that companies have and the supply that employees might have. And these particularly digital skills that are fast developing as this overall digital environment is, are most often happening in cities. And this is why we conclude that the future of work might, from a technical perspective, be remote. It is unlikely that it will liberate um, work from the current urban rural divides, and that it is unlikely to see um, the thriving of, of rural economies or cost of, of urban areas. Instead, it will rather reinforce inequalities between urban and rural areas across the, um, across, um, across the globe. And um, to wrap up, what to do with that information? 
and what uh, to do as an implication from this research. First of all, I think it is important to acknowledge um, the network structure of the economy, which is increasingly taken in this field of complexity economics and others. So to really think of the economy of the economy not just as a standalone isolated thing but really as a representation of different networks that interact with each other skills um, education and so on and so forth and uh, dependent on who you are um, you can find different results and different implications from the research if you are for example an employment agency or an individual um, worker that wants to upskill you could try to predict skill demand you could try from the network data which is available as we just saw here from the network visualization you could try to predict which skills are becoming more important in the overall network and identify market niches that you could go into so those that have not so much competition and and that are likely to thrive in the future if you are a rural policymaker or maybe the european commission and you want to increase the chances of rural areas or as it is done here in the UK, for example, to get a more balanced um, perspective on the different parts of the of the um, national economy, you should definitely invest in infrastructure and think of how you could connect the rural economy to network flows that are happening in the in the global economy. And this, I think, is an important finding, an important takeaway, because it brings away the attention from the digital economy per se. A lot of discussions that we also have at the Oxford Internet Institute are around the recommendation systems and the power of algorithms, online monitoring, everything that's related to the digital interface and the power of the platform. Maybe this all plays a role, but I want to emphasize again, our model here that we have used in the data doesn't consider anything related to the platforms, just representation of the data in terms of the geography and related standard traditional economic indicators that come from World Bank, OECD, and so on and so forth. And we really see that um, what happens in terms of the geography online is a manifestation of traditional um, existing inequalities. Therefore, investment in, in the traditional things that maybe the International Monetary Fund would have recommended or the World Bank seem to be things that are also relevant for the digital economy. And last but not least, um, if you are an urban employer or a rural employer, you would want to adapt to further city growth. So assume that urbanization will go on and that, for example, as a rural employer, you would want to use online labor markets and platforms like these to get access to this talent, which is more likely to gather in urban areas because of, as we just saw, this um, dense um, connection between um, enabling institutions and skills. As a rural employer, this could allow you maybe to uh, stay in your local environment and uh, be um, yeah, engaged in this in the local community more. Also, um, you could maybe think of um, bringing in things like um, co-working spaces in your local rural environment in order to um, allow people that would work via on the labor markets to work together, to connect with each other and have an as close as possible interaction with um, the next um, larger urban agglomeration and of course try to get access um, um, access to urban talents and dependent on whatever way you look like i hope this is a number of implications that make sense and that overall um, this presentation could convince you that the future of work even though it's technically possible to be remote will probably see the same kind of spatial inequalities that we saw over the past decades and centuries thank you very much